Well, we got to the end of the day, and we're the last presenters at the end of the day, so please bear with us as we walk through this. Some of these things you've heard a little bit about today, and hopefully uh, between Chuck and I, we can kind of tie up some ends and uh, explain a few things and answer some questions that may not have been uh, answered earlier. So we're going to start off and we're going to talk about uh, carbon, carbon cycle, and then we're going to talk some more about carbon nitrogen ratios. I like to start things off with big picture. So this is kind of the big picture of the whole carbon thing. And of course, carbon's been in the news a lot. There's too much carbon in the atmosphere, you know. Um, fossil fuels. Well, if you look at the big picture, fossil fuels isn't a lot. Most of the carbon is stored in an inert form in the Earth's crust. And of course, we don't have any impact on that, so we're not going to spend a lot of time there. Okay, the next slide we have here um, is the cyclic and semi-cyclic semi uh, flows of carbon. And these we will begin to look at, and specifically some of the ones that we do impact as agricultural producers in the area. So this gives you an idea of what we're looking, and uh, I thought this was uh, interesting, the uh, pentagrams of carbon. So if you can put all the zeros on the end, you can get the answer to that one. Okay, and here, now we're getting down to what we're going to start to get into a little bit, and this is the carbon processes that we we directly, that directly impact us through our involvement and use of natural resources. So this is kind of where we're going to look at it in the big picture. And of course, we heard a little bit about photosynthesis, basically moving, removing carbon from the atmosphere and producing sugars that tend to work. And Chuck is going to explain a little bit more of that with the microbiology. OK, and then uh, uh, the carbon cycle and the plants we grow and um, how that kind of works through the system. And again, understanding systems is important um, to me anyways in, in applying things to the ground. If we understand the system we're working in, then we know and have an idea of what we could impact or not impact. Okay, the carbon cycle in its start, basically it starts with the sun's energy. Uh, it's utilized to capture and modify atmospheric carbon and the processes of the resulting carbon and sugars. Okay, and then finally, um, what are we talking about? How much carbon, all right? And I thought this is pretty interesting. Um, Chuck and I were involved in a project a few years ago that we mapped the carbon resources. We were part of mapping the carbon resources in the country with the idea that the soil is one of the places that we could potentially impact to put some of this carbon back into the ground. And the biggest potential impactors are you, our agricultural producers, and that you can can store a lot of carbon in what you're doing, and I think we've kind of heard some of that. So this is the organic carbon cycle, and again, you know, you're talking about some 1% organic matter, 20,000 pounds of carbon, and you can start to look at some of the things that are, you know, that's a small city's worth of stuff. So anyways, we'll uh, get a little bit more into the detail of this whole carbon cycle. Okay, so I'm going to introduce my colleague Chuck, and he's going to take it over. Thanks, Dave. You know, I essentially uh, volunteered Dave to do this, so you can see how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what does uh, soil organic matter, what does it matter to soil health? Excellent. Um, just uh, some basics here. Uh, the definition, soil organic matter is a complex, very mixture of organic substances. Um, of course, uh, uh, carbon makes up about half of that. Most of you probably already know that, but uh, just to get the basics down, next slide. Um, this is a, kind of a repeat of what Dave was just saying, but uh, the, the words in red are what I'd like you all to remember. 1% uh, of soil organic matter, SOM, uh, is 20,000 pounds per acre to 6 inches. That's just on average. And um, the next one down, it takes hundred tons of organic material applied back to the soil in order to get that one percent. So it, the point is, is it takes a lot of material to put in the soil to get that one percent organic matter. Next slide. And this is a, another repeat, but I wanted to emphasize something on this slide. Go ahead. That's the root exudates. Um, people tend to just say that in passing. Root exudates are huge. That's how the plants talk to the microbes, that's how the microbes, uh, that's how the microbes talk to each other, and it's one of the main pathways uh, 
It's called the Liquid Carbon Pathway. I think Christine Jones in Australia coined that term. That's how to get uh, carbon into the soil long term. It goes, it's mainly uh, sugars, and that's how the plant feeds the microbes, and the microbes die, and those uh, microbe bodies essentially go into the soil humus. And uh, that humus stays there a long time, and I'll talk more about that here. Next slide. Okay, we'll get into the fractions here. On this first one on the left, that's just an idealized uh, pie chart of, uh, of your average soil. And actually, that's a really good soil. 5% organic matter, it's actually better than most typical conventional agricultural soils. Um, so, that's fine. So out of that 5% organic matter, the chart on the right is showing uh, what that, uh, the different pools, we call pools of uh, soil organic matter. And again, this is really idealized because, um, as you'll see in the next slide, that uh, um, the stable there on the left, I'm sorry. Ah, that's, good. <laughs> that's uh, very small, actually. That's, it says 30, 30 to 50 percent. That's a really small percentage when it's actually much larger in most agricultural soils. And that uh, decomposing or active fraction there this is a really active soil, and that's pretty uncommon unless you're in a, a really, where it's really active in lots of organic matter going into the soil, or if you're in a sandy soil, like uh, in Brandon soils, Brandon soils, he's basically farming a sand pile. So it's really hard for that, uh, like a loamy sand, to get that uh, stabilized organic matter. talk about the different pools here, and actually this is from a uh, textbook from Brady and Weil, and it's, uh, I would really highly recommend it if anybody's in the textbooks, but it's uh, Nature and Properties of Soils, and it's really focused towards sustainable agriculture from the management side. It's, it's a huge book, it's got tons of information, but these guys say that the active fraction is only 10 to 20 percent, and I, I believe that that's the more real figure. That fraction persists for only one to two years. And it's, uh, okay. yeah, we're going to the slow pool here, which is the intermediate term. I mean, it's measured more on the, term, on the, on the lines of, uh, uh, let's see, slow pool, 100 years. I think I got that one mixed up. But anyway, yeah, we'll get to the next pool. Okay, and the passive pool is the more interesting one there, because that's the, where the solar hemus is. That's the pool that persists for a long time, um, measured on the order of you know, centuries to millennia, actually. And, uh, okay, the next slides, I'll go into more detail on what these are. Okay, the active pool, again, it's a small percentage of most soils. It's only, it's only measured in one to two years, it persists in a soil for only one to two years. And uh, that's the living biomass, particularly organic matter. It's little tiny pieces of plants that you may be able to recognize if you put it under a scope or something like that. Polysaccharides, other non-human substance and substances, and that includes, includes globalin. That's a big uh, discovery, the recent discovery about uh, the material that helps hold soils together and helps the soil structure. Okay, next bullet. And these, this is what uh, the main point I want to emphasize is the properties that each of these pools uh, affect. Um, so for this one, the active pool, uh, it affects structural stability, uh, infiltration, erosion resistance, uh, soil tilth, bulk density, uh, indirectly by porosity. Um, and it's making, you know, when the soil's got good structure, it's also got good porosity. So, uh, it contains most of the mineralizable nitrogen and the available nutrients. And it includes accumulated micronutrients. So it's very important. Important that active fraction is very important from that standpoint. It's the first pool to be affected by management practices. So if you're going, if you till your ground, it's the first thing you're going to notice are those properties there: uh, structure and infiltration. Those are the things that go away. 
that we can tell. And, um, and uh, when, conversely, if the first things that come back, we start adding organic material back into the soil. Okay, the passive pool. Um, it consists, consists of human, as most of the humic acids and some of the fulvic acids. And uh, it's usually complexed with clay particles. So the humus clay particle complex is why that persists so long. And that's why in the case of sandy soils, like Brandon Rocky, he's not going to get long-term storage in this humus com complex because it's being exposed to the air and uh, the microbes much more easily than it is more readily than it is in a clay soil. Clay soils, for instance, I think it was 2%. Is that right, Brendan? It's right in here. It's about 2% that he had in his soils, and that's really good for a sandy soil. Um, but for a clay loam soil, that's not much. Um, I'd like to see, you know, a 4, 5, 6% in a clay soil, or even if it's in the Midwest, you know, we end up in the teens. But uh, the point is, sandy soils, can't hold on to that long-term carbon very long. And the properties uh, that uh, this affects, the passive pool affects mostly is uh, what we call colloidal properties, and that's usually what we attribute to clays. And that's, uh, again, that's the clay humus complex that makes that, uh, 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 well, for instance, cation exchange capacity, that's a, a major very important soil property that uh, we need to consider. And uh, low density, it's not from porosity. It, when it's complex with the clay, it's just from its simple light weightness. You know, it's, it's more like a sponge. It's not because it's making pores bigger it, at this level. It's because it's just like being acting like a sponge. And of course, the water holding capacity from that. That's where most of the water holding capacity comes from when you're talking about organic. So although this is um, it's the most stable pool, um, if you practice intensive tillage, you keep exposing that uh, organic matter to air, to microbes, it eventually goes away too. So especially if it's intensive, if you keep doing it, pounding it, you know, several times a year, it's going to go away. It's not going to stick around. Slow pool, that's just the, the, the medium one. It's not real exciting, but it is important in the sense that there's a background population of microbes, and they're important to keep things going. And, you know, there's not a lot of additions or activity going on. Call them. I forget what they're called, but anyway, um, it's important for them because it's, it's just a long term, it keeps things going. Things are slow. And it holds a significant Hold a significant portion of nitrogen also for that longer term uh, population. It contributes pretty much to the same properties as the uh, as the active fraction. Okay, this is probably the slide I want you guys to remember the most. Which uh, soil properties each of these pools affects? Uh, the active pool, of course, structure, infiltration, tilt, and uh, immediately available nutrients, and the bulk density. Pool, um, cation exchange capacity, bulk density from a clay humus complex, and the water holding capacity and carbon sequestration. So when somebody's talking about sequestration, carbon sequestration, it's really you got to consider the kind of soils that you're working with. The same like I say, the sandy soils don't really lend themselves to long-term carbon sequestration. And soil pool, uh, it's the same properties as the active pool, but just to a minor extent. Okay, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. I want to talk about the soil food web. And uh, there's been some people talking about that already. So here it is. Just hold it still close. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, we want to focus on the soil biology and the soil food webs. So, 
This is, uh, many of you have seen this before, this is a USDA publication, but this diagram was made by uh, Elaine Ingham, and uh, there's one important arrow on this that's been missing, and she said, I'm not sure she's, I'm not sure why USDA took it out, I think it was cluttered or something like that, but uh, and that's the arrow that needs to be in there. That's real important. What that's saying is that those red root nematodes, they eat the root feeder nematodes that they can't eat. So if, if you have red root nematodes in there, you're, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a, a root feeder nematode problem. So in this diagram, it just shows you basically the mineralization cycle, soil mineralization cycle. And uh, so I wanted to show you the carbon and nitrogen ratios to focus on. Specifically nitrogen, but it's uh, the same concept with all the nutrients. Um, so we'll look at the carbon nitrogen ratios in this slide. So over there on the left, the carbon nitrogen ratio of organic matter varies widely. It's 25 to 500. Next. And next one. So in fungi and bacteria, the carbon nitrogen ratio is pretty low. Um, 5 to 10, 10 to 20. So these guys are out there decomposing and eating my material, organic matter. And uh, so what's real important next is the, uh, the third trophy level there on the bottom, the bottom of the uh, predators and the shredders and grazers, mainly the predators. From the standpoint, as you can see, that carbon nitrogen ratio is 20 to 30. Next, well, and it's 50 to 100 for nematodes. I've been finding a lot of different numbers for that one, but the point is, is that they're high. So what happens when the nematodes and the protozoa, all those predators, eat the fungi and the bacteria? Where's that nitrogen? It's that, what was it, poop cycle or something like that? <laughs> so the nitrogen is coming available. That's mineralization. The nitrogen's coming available to uh, plants again. So you have to have all of these predator and prey, decomposers, the shredders, etc. You gotta have all of them in there for the, for the mineralization cycle to uh, be complete. So this is a slide that's used by the Soil Health Cadre team quite a bit, and I like it, it's a pretty slide, but I don't quite agree with it. Um, what we have here on the top is an animal cell, and on the bottom right is a plant cell lower left is a bacterial cell. That's it. The bacterial cell is actually a slow release fertilizer because the plant and animal cells are being eaten by the decomposers. So the bacterial cell is definitely a slow release fertilizer. And I would like to see a, a fungal cell in there. That's, that would be your other slow release fertilizer. Okay, uh, the next four or five slides here, or just uh, videos I took with my microscope. And uh, go back one. Is there a play button on there? No. No play button. Darn. Well, it's, it's supposed to be a video. But anyway, this is a... Uh, yeah, no, there's no play button. Darn. Well, well, those are videos you have to take my word for. <laughs> that one's not real exciting. This one is a flagellate protozoa. As you can see there, it's uh, got microbes inside of it. It's mineralization in action. What I was going to try to show you, not working at both. But uh, this is what they do. And I've cheated on these slides because I took these out of, uh, out of my work compost bin rather than an agricultural field or my garden even. So in a worm thing, the good thing about worm compost is this right here. It's full of these guys, the protozoa, the predators. Completes the mineralization cycle, so everybody's uh, gets excited when they talk about worm composter. That's such a great thing. This is why, because it promotes uh, the predator, it promotes this whole food web, keeps that cycle going. So let's see what the next slide is. That was a close-up of it. You can see all the uh, bacteria inside the flagellate there. And this is a nematode, and I'm pretty sure that this is a predator nematode because it's huge. You guys can't tell that, but you can probably hold the slide up to the light and, and see it with your naked eye. So usually those big ones are predators. So the next slide 
It's a little hard to tell. That's the, a close-up of the mouth. And it's got a huge mouth like that. It's typically a predator. And uh, in a root feeder, they would have like a spear there. And that spear is what penetrates the, uh, the root. So this is definitely not bad. This is a good guy. So, like I So this is a slide that Ray Archuleta likes to use. And uh, I like it because a lot of people look at that field and say, oh, that looks pretty, nice and groomed. There. But uh, it's not what we want. We've got to change our, our paradigm of what farm and pretty is. And this isn't really farm and pretty because this soil is naked, hungry, thirsty, and running a fever. So, as Wayne Seaton says, we need to farm ugly, keep the cover crop, keep the residue on, keep that biological cycle going. Okay? Dave's the next. Thanks, Chuck. As you can see, it's a complex world. You think you got it bad? Think about all these critters in there, you know? I mean, I, there was a statement made earlier about uh, what's going on is kind of like Times Square on uh, New Year's Eve. Well, it is. I mean, you know, what's interesting about this whole soil, and I get pretty excited, Chuck does, because the biology is finally coming where it needs to be, which is in prominence. Um, I get excited about it because it's, we know less about the soil ecology than we do the deep sea oceans or outer space. So there's a lot to be learned and there's a lot of exciting things I believe that is coming up on the road. <coughs> but uh, anyway, so that, let's kind of go to the next thing and we've heard a little bit about it, which is uh, carbon nitrogen ratios. And there's some questions and uh, so I'm going to ask you, what is it? What's carbon nitrogen ratios? You, you were told that earlier, does anybody remember? I'm going to walk around because you wake up and that I can tell you're snoring out here. What's carbon nitrogen ratios? The relationship between carbon and nitrogen. Okay, the relationship between carbon and nitrogen. And so, what does it mean? And why should you, as producers, as stewards of the land, even be concerned or understand this? And again, it, it all kind of ties back in with the soil health thing. So, Let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to walk around with my notes because the million or so acres I covered, I can't always remember things quite as well as I once did. So. Okay, so carbon nitrogen ratio means exactly what this gentleman shared, which is the ratio of the mass of carbon to nitrogen as substance. And so here's some common carbon nitrogen ratios that you'll see out there. And you'll notice that some of them are lower and some of them are significantly higher. And you know, what I find interesting here is, as Chuck was saying, the bacteria and fungi, and by the way, they make up the bulk of the soil biota. They're the ones that are on the bottom, and the predators are the, the minor components of that, like in any ecosystem. But their ratios of uh, carbon and nitrogen fall somewhere generally between 4 to 1 and 10 to 1. So can you see a difference between their food and them? And this is a key, this is important to understand, right? Um, and the reason behind it is, is because these organisms require more protein than carbohydrates. And so protein is needed primarily for earth tissue building, carbon for energy. Remember the plant, the photosynthesis, what the plant is doing is generating sugars and is building its own cell, but the, the, the sugars become food to attract the biota which extracts the nutrients from the soil. And so it's kind of important to understand this because everything, you and I included, are carbon-based life forms. And the soil biology is no different, okay? So, here's some other things that affect carbon and nitrogen ratios, okay? The soil in general, and it includes the organic fraction, which is very small, but it also includes the rest of the soil because there is nitrogen and there is carbon in the rest of the soil. And basically, it runs somewhere between 10 to 1 and 20. And here's some interesting things. And if you think about the mobility of nitrogen, you'll begin to see some of the correlations here that we're talking about, okay? Increased water tends to flush it, okay? Unless it's held by the organic matter within its content. The organic matter CDC or the soil EC, CDC, which is the cation exchange process. That's what makes it the nutrients there for your plants. If you have sandy soils, you have very low CDC unless you have organic matter. My Florida days, they didn't have a whole lot, so it was almost like hydroponics in some places down there. 
Okay, and, and then uh, you notice the cold temperatures. You, know, you remember earlier in the day they showed a picture of the peat bog? and how you had all that carbon stored there because basically the plants were producing it but the biology was slow so it didn't get ate up. So colder temperatures affect that and then acidity, if you think about it, can also affect the mobility of nitrogen. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you some questions. How many here are farmers? Anybody here farmers? Okay. How many here have hired people that work for them? Anybody have some people? And if you work on your own farm, then you're hired by yourself, so you're going to them too, okay? Because you're a hired worker on your own place. So, what are these basic needs of these workers? What are some of the things they need? Water. They need to drink, right? If you're out in the field, you're working, and you don't drink, you're not going to be out in the field very long, are you? What else? What else do you need, these workers need, to be able to be successful in helping you with your farm? What else? Air. If they don't breathe, they're not going to last very long. Okay? They got to breathe. Okay? Food. They got to have food. That's where the carbon comes in. Okay? They got to have food. And what else? Shelter. They got a house. I mean, when you get done with the day, do you want to just lay down in your field? No. You want to go to a place where you can live and grow and feel safe and have a family and all those good things. So that's kind of how that fits in there. And what else? What's that? Obamacare? <laughs> Try the website. Anyways, um, well, energy, but let me ask you this. Do you, you know, I, I ran out, and I was a soul scientist in South Florida for a while. And I got out there, and I ended up going to my first duty station there in July. No. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think I was as a productive a soil scientist in July as I was in December in Florida? No, because it was too hot. Conversely, if I go to the field now and I start dropping acid and making mud pies, and that's what you pay me to do as a soil scientist, and there's a story behind that. But anyways, if I'm out there texturing and I got water on my hands, I'm not going to do a lot of texturing because my hands are going to freeze. So you need a temperature that affects how much work you can do. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, sorry, I forgot I was working here. Okay. So, we got this guy here, alright? And he's ready to eat, okay? And there's the water, okay? And there's the house with the family. Okay, and one more. So, I think that kind of, uh, kind of covers what we need there. So, how does this all relate? Well, what I'm hoping to do as I lead into more carbon nitrogen ratios, I'm gonna digress and sidestep a little bit here. I want you to consider that you guys have billions of workers. Did you know that if you took, is Berlin still here? Berlin is still here. You know, I go up to Berlin Rockies, and you know, he, he, he takes me out in his field, and he, and he gets there, and he, and he scoops up the soil, and he brings it, and he sticks it in my face, and he goes, can you smell this? It smells so good. Well, you know, if you took a double handful of productive, healthy topsoil, did you know that there's more living organisms in a double handful of topsoil and there have been human beings that have ever walked the face of this earth at all. So think about it. These are, I want you to think that these are your workers. They're either going to work for you or they're not going to work for you. Okay? They're there and they have needs that need to be met. They can't move to the next county. They can't go to the next farmer. They're on your farm. And how they are is how you're going to treat them. Okay? So, Let's go ahead to the next slide. So, your soil biology workers, okay, they gotta have some basic things. They gotta have the food, okay? Let me ask you this. If you went out and ate hamburgers every day, seven days a week, would you be healthy? No. no. Well, I hope not. I mean, hamburgers are seven days a week. I mean, once in a while is pretty good, but the work is the same way. They need they need a diversity of food, they need a diversity of food at different times, okay? They need water. Let me ask you this, do you drink all the water you need in a day before you go to the field or you take water with you? You take it with you, you need it at periodic times during the day to be able to be most efficient, okay? Air. Workers can't breathe if they're underwater. And remember, half the soil is going to be pore space that's going to be filled with one of two things. 
air, or water. Hopefully both, because they need both, okay? And then climate. Now we can't affect a lot of climate, but climate can affect how we cash in on the carbon nitrogen ratio, so we're gonna get to that. And of course, then they need a place to live. If uh, you came along every spring and tore the roof off your house, how many times would you want to rebuild your house? How many times would you survive continually losing the place you live? Now remember, these guys don't have a choice. They gotta stay in the field when you go home, okay? Your workers are there. And hopefully they're working 24-7 for you, okay? All right, next slide. Another question you have to ask, do you need lots of workers with lots of different skills or a few workers with limited skills? When do you want these workers to make this crop? And by the way, the crop is nitrogen. That's what we spend most of our money on in the fields, right, that to produce a commodity, is nitrogen. And the crop that these, you're trying to get your workers to produce for you is nitrogen that goes into your next plant that's coming up, okay? So, when do you want it? When do you want to build your cash crop? Which is your plan. So, if you have human workers, does everybody harvest the crop? Does everybody drive the truck? Does everybody pack? No, you have different people with different skills. The, the soil biology is the same thing. Chuck was getting into some of those things on that, that these workers are there and they have specific duties. Do you just make one worker do all the duties? Or do you try to make sure that all the workers have all of their needs met so that you can be most efficient and most productive? Yeah, same thing. Soil workers are the same. So, the other thing about this is, is do you need your workers to harvest your crop halfway through the season? Remember, your crop here is nitrogen. And these workers will get nitrogen for you. They will get it out of the soil. They will get it from the carbon, from the plant residence. But when do you want it delivered? Would you somebody send somebody out to pick your sweet corn in uh, June? No. So when do you want your crop of nitrogen? When do you want your workers to produce it for? And again, these are all things that should be going on. And again, it has to do with what we've been looking at today, with the cover crops, and also with compost and different things like that. So, you oftentimes hire different human workers to harvest different crops. So different species of soil biology specialize in processing your end from different sources as well as store, transport, and deliver the crop of it. Okay. So, there they are. You need to be able to have somebody to process it, somebody to hold it, somebody to transport it and then make it available to your plants, just like you do with your human workers. And this is what we're trying to get at with this whole soil health thing. I know it seems kind of complex, but when you boil it down to the basics, it's still pretty simple and pretty straightforward. So, let's remember our CN ratios. Your CN ratios of your biological workers are 4 to 1 and 10 to 1. CN ratios of the soil are 10 to 1 to 21, and CN ratios of plants range from 12 to 400 to 1. Has anybody ever seen a pile of wood chips? And they just kind of sit there, and they kind of sit there? You know, that's lots of carbon, that's lots of fuel, but why is it being used? Because it has very high CN ratios, and if there's no N, they can't, it can't be processed. That's basically what you're dealing with here. So what do you do when you have that? And, and how do you deal with these carbon nitrogen ratios? If you produce, and we looked, you know, we, when we looked at uh, what Keith was sharing about uh, crops in 45 to 1 CN ratio, he was saying that was kind of hot. What that means is, is that that's going to take a while to break that whole thing down. If you have a more diverse mix, then some of these things are going to disappear quicker than others. I mean, if you look at the stuff that has the nitrogen fixers in them, they tend to have lower carbon and nitrogen ratios. They will disappear very quickly. How long does beans lay on your field after you harvest them? Are they there very long? The bean, you know, after you go in and you harvest your bean crop and you lay it on the ground, how quickly does it disappear? But what about the corn? When you see corn, how long does that take to disappear? And oftentimes we, we might plant a monoculture or one species and then we have trouble with carbon nitrogen ratios because the, the nitrogen is all being tied up 
and so you heard Keith talk a little bit about this, it's not available for you to use. Your cash crop isn't there when you need it. That's why it's important to understand carbon nitrogen ratios. Okay? And again, think of it as workers. Think of it as one you want it done. You need to understand your workers. You need to understand what you have them do. Okay. So here's the process. So you're going to have to help me on this. So you got organic matter, which is your carbon in various states, and CN ratios. So what happens? Okay, they eat, right? All right? And it gets ate by your... And these little guys are what? That's your workers, right? Okay? Your workers work slower in the... Cold. You guys remember these things? I'm not that old, am I? You guys remember these little things? I probably was something kind of cold. So I had to make one. This was quite fun. Okay, so you got the cold, or they don't work quite as well when it's too hot, okay? So, and what happens when it gets too hot? They go on strike, or they go dormant, that's what we say happens, or they die, they rest in peace. Well, maybe not peace, and they become nitrogen, and that releases, but anyways, okay? That's what happens when it gets too hot. The next sentence, workers need to breathe and breathe, okay? to live. These, workers. okay, then need to, and I think we heard the, yeah, there you go, I'll give it to you. Yeah, they need to do this, or they need to die to release what? The end. And Chuck said, you know, you look at this and you, you see these bacteria are getting ate and the processes are going on and, and that's where it's coming from. And that's the processes that these workers are doing in your soil for you, okay? To, Okay, too soon and N may be lost. Okay, not there, unavailable, tied up someplace. Okay, too late and and may be lost. It may be not there for you to need. So that's why it's important. That's why it's important to consider your crop and what you want to follow up with and what you're going to put in if you're going to do a cover crop and you're going to deal with carbon nitrogen ratios or if you're going with a cropping cycle. You're going to put one and then another and another. And it's important to understand these things because it's this balance that's going to help you reduce your inputs of the most expensive fertilizer you'll have, which is nitrogen. Okay, next one. So, here is the words. Diversity of cover crops gives you diversity of food. Okay? And your vitamins or minerals, different things for your biological workers. If you think of it that way, it makes more sense to me. Diversity of cover crops gives you different CN ratios, which give you different rates of organic matter decay and release of nitrogen. This N is needed in the products of photosynthesis where carbon is removed from CO2 in the air and added with N to form your new plant structure. So that's really what you're dealing with. And again, certain times if you're not careful, your N can be all tied up. That's when you'll have to go in and add N, okay? because you don't have enough to, to continue the process. The wood chips will break down if you added some men and some water to them. They will disappear eventually, okay? But it has to be those workers to break it down. Okay. Next one. That's the end. Sadie, go back one more. The worker got tired. We got tired. <laughs> okay, anyways, this is what I had in the last slide. It's the future. Okay? I believe that in the future of sustainable farming and understanding CN ratios of your organic matter, coupled with your climate, soil biology, physical and chemical soil properties, and crop growth needs and physiology, will become a working tool to manage and optimize different crops and cropping systems to enhance production, minimize inputs, conserve and enhance soil and water resources, and reduce negative environmental impacts. As we treat our workers so that they work the best for us, this is what the system will involve. You know, the soil is not just a place that holds our plant roots and is a storage vault for water and fertilizer. It is perhaps the most complex ecosystem on the planet. And you guys do the job of working with it. We need to start thinking of our soil as a living system of workers that are managed by you, the steward of the land. Understanding your soil worker needs, providing them with healthy foods at the right time in the right environment, a 
air, water, temperature, with a good stable place to live and grow, will result in a highly productive and skilled soil workforce at your command. Treat the living system right, and it will efficiently labor for you, and you will reap the bounty of the harvest now and into this foreseeable future. That's carbon nitrogen, that's what we're all about.